Welcome back to Pathfinder Wrath of the Righteous. In the last episode, we uh, did the initial assault on the Grey Garrison, or where we will go back. And in this episode, we are now at the Defender's Heart, where we have a lot of people we need to talk to. This is our personal chest. Anything we put in here will be uh, transferred on to um, later areas as well. So that is a useful thing to have. But... Let's just get right on to it, because there is a lot of dialogue going on here, so, uh, yeah. Hey, wait. Mind if I bend your ear about something? Anivia is outside your door, leaning casually against a shelf. So, here's the first and most important thing. Death gave you a crucial mission. I get that, and I know you'll get the job done. I saw you in action. But here's the rub. By sending you out on an errand, we are weakening our defenses here. If they come at us while you're gone, I don't know if you will be able to fight them off. Everything everything seems clear so far. What else do you wish to discuss? So, the rift that damned beetle left with its scythe. Yeah, well, it cut the city into two and it's kind of difficult to get across. My scouts tell me there is a halfway decent place to set up a crossing in Market Square. Not that any of them try to make sure... But if you've got a mind to go across, and I think you're going to have to eventually, you might want to give the square a once-over. Do you want me to stay here and guard the tavern? You what? No, your task is far too important. You can't just hole up here or cozy-like waiting for the demons to knock on the door. We need to take the fight to them. But if those freaks try to make a move on this place, Beth will send a runner to get you. If that happens, you leg it back here, alright? Because if you don't, you'll be coming back to an ash pile. Got it? When do you think the demons will attack next? Your guess is as good as mine. They might not be here. They could attack the whole damn city. Those vermin know they've lost the upper hand and that we're going to push back hard. If things kick off here, you should know after they attack, some things could be changed beyond recognition. So if you've got any business that needs taking care of, you'd better do it soon. Thank you for the warning. See you later. Later. Watch yourself out there. Let's talk to Staunton. The dwarf resembles an abandoned citadel, one whose high crumbling walls are still holding fast, but whose empty lightless windows make it clear that all inside is dead. Oh, it's you. Good work back there in the Grey Garrison. Name's Staunton Vane. If you've heard rumours about me... His face, which looks like it has never known anything as carefree as a smile, grimaces. Just so you know, everything people say about me, it's true. What do people say about you? They say I'm a traitor, as bad as Arulu Vorlish. That I'm a disgrace, even among the ranks of the condemned. That Queen Galfrey should never have spared me. That I belong on the gallows. Why do they hate you so much? You really don't know? Staunton gives you a long, morose look, then sighs. I'm the reason why the Crusade forces are holed up in fortresses on the edge of the world wound instead of fight bringing the fight to the demons. We used to have a foothold in the wound, the mighty, unassailable city of Dresden. We used to have it until it fell, and all because of my stupidity. I gave the enemy our main citadel. I was tried. They wanted to execute me, and rightly so, but the Queen intervened. She said that I should live and fight in order to undo what I had done. So that's how I live. Decade after decade, fighting in the Condemned. The Dwarf shrugs. As you can see, I have fixed nothing, and I have earned no one's forgiveness. Are you going to spit in my face too? It wouldn't surprise me. You keep living and fighting with no hope of anything better, because that's what the Queen ordered you to do. There's honour in that. Maybe right, but you know, even stone and iron get worn down over time. I know what it means to live a regimented life, but I cannot rely on my discipline alone forever. I pray to Torag, although he does not listen, that my body breaks before my conscience does. The whole city fell because of you. How is that possible? What do you mean, how? 
The knight glares at you from beneath his furrowed brows. If you don't trust the word of a condemned, go ask somebody else, like my little brother Joran. And if you still don't believe it, what's it to me? But if you're about to ask me to recount the whole story of my disgrace for the thousandth time, don't. You really don't have any friends? I couldn't have survived this long if I were completely alone. Joran, my little brother, he keeps me going. He's never abandoned me. Everyone else shies away from me like they might, like they might catch what I've got. Even fighters in the Condemned console themselves by thinking, I got stripped of my rank, but at least I'm not Staunton. Commander Tirabade seems to be the only person in the whole army who remembers that I'm a soldier and not a drudge. She has no qualms about taking me into battle. She's had some mud flung at her in the past or so I hear. That's why she keeps to keep an that's why she tries to keep an open mind about people. It's no surprise that she's the only one to hold on to her sense of reason in this farce. So many years in the condemned, surely you have paid your penance by now. That's not up to me to decide. My life is in the Queen's hands. He falls silent for a moment, and then in a trembling voice he adds, The Condemned isn't the worst part. All these years I have prayed to Torag for forgiveness. Countless times I've gone to his priests. Countless times I've kneeled before his altar. If only the father of dwarven kind would answer my prayers just once. Not to restore what I've lost, but just to tell me that I am still one of his children. But it seems he doesn't give a damn about me. What can I expect from mere mortals when my own god doesn't think I deserve redemption? I need to talk to the elf who calls himself the Storyteller. Do you know where I can find him? Storyteller? Hmm. Staunton strokes his beard in thought. A strange old fellow, that one. He used to sit with me for hours, asking about all sorts of things. He never offered judgement or comfort, he just listened. At first I wanted him and his questions as far away from me as possible, but later I realised that talking to him did ease my burden a little. I hope he's alive and well. He's completely blind and feeble too, so if he's alone in the city, well, you probably know what that means. I do know one place he might be. Look for him in the Black Wing. It's a library. Here. I'll show you where it is on the map. I don't know what use a library is to a blind elf, but he loved the place. He would sit there, day and night. I have to go. Go on, then. Maybe we'll see each other again. Next up we have Camellia. Camellia looks over you... <clears throat> sorry. Camellia looks you over pensively toying with a snake-shaped bone amulet that dangles from her pale neck. Noticing your glance, she flashes you a cold, barely there smile. Greetings. It seems for a moment that she wants to say something else, but the pause grows too long and she slips back into cautious silence. Tell me about yourself. Do you want to know more about me than you already do? Why? Camellia arches a dainty brow. I talk to the spirits of this tormented land and they guide me in battle. I'll help you fight the demons, and I swear that you can rely on me in this matter. Isn't that sufficient? Where did you learn to wield a rapier so well? I had good teachers. Although they don't get all the credit, I am a most diligent student. Amelia licks her parched lips. Your amulet is quite unusual. Where did you get it? Ah, my little trinket. It is so nice of you to notice, but I assure you this amulet is nothing but a bauble. Can a lady not be drawn to beautiful useless things? Anyway, as much as I enjoy our delightful conversations, uh, the spirits are calling me and I must respond. Please excuse me. Amelia turns away, watching you out of the corner of her eye. And then we have Horgus Gwyrm. 1,000 gold coins for you, just as promised. You helped me get back to the surface, and I duly paid you for escorting me. Orgus Gwyrm always keeps his word. Now, speaking of our future cooperations... Orgus looks at you with, an, with unvarnished disapproval, his arms folded across his chest, his foot tapping impatiently. I have a job that would be perfect for some, someone like you. Naturally, I'll pay generously for your services. What do you mean, a job for someone like For an adventurer ready to sell their soul for booze and then lie down drunk in the gutter? 
Do you think you're somehow different? A travelling knight, perhaps? Noble of heart, but without a coin to your name? Orgus sizes you up critically, then sighs and shrugs. You seem a reliable enough ally to me, and you did get me out of those mongrel caves. So why should I care what you do with my money once you've got it? Succeeded at a perception check. Orgus seems like one of those people who thinks the entire world owes them something. However, you hear notes of hysteria beneath his smug arrogance. It is as though he's really quite nervous, but taking great pains to conceal it. Noble birth doesn't give you the right to behave badly. I would ask that you refrain from such statements in the future. Orgus puts his hands on his hips. Oh, really? How impudent. No one dares tell Orgus Gwurm how to address the rabble. So what does this job involve? You shall be my bodyguard. You see, I have good reason to return to my mansion here in Kinabras. I still have... Well, it doesn't matter, it's none of your business. My mansion is a breathtaking building with a large garden in the wealthy part of the city. Even before the demons attack, every... attacked, every thief and fraudster in the city had tried to get inside one way or another. I shudder to imagine the state it is in now. I have little hope that my guards were able to hold the mansion during the attack, and I expect that the servants fled when they saw the demons. Only Abadar knows, what hap knows what's happened there since. Therefore, I would ask that you meet me at my mansion and guard me there until I complete my business. I already asked the local paladins for help, but they have no desire to set foot outside this tavern. Damn cowards and traitors, that's what they are. Also, please do take Camellia with you. I trust that girl more than the rest of your gang. She is of noble birth, after all. What kind of reward are we talking about? A thousand gold coins, Horvus replies without hesitation. I doubt we're going to be able to roll 14 or more, but let's try it. Double the reward and I'll think about it. Oh, we succeeded. Several tense moments pass in silence, then Horgus's face relaxes. Deal. Deal. Marvellous, most excellent. Horgus's face relaxes, smoothing a few of the tense lines. I'll proceed to my mansion at once and wait for you there. Meanwhile, you needn't worry. I know the city like the back of my hand. But do hurry, unless you want me to lower your reward. Uh, I'll take a very, very quick uh, break here. So uh, the pause will be uh, more or less instantaneous for you guys. There we go. I also noticed that I have leveled up, which is uh, kind of important that I do. Um, yeah, let's, uh, um, let's do the leveling up first. Uh, we'll continue with the Sylvan Sorcerer. Uh, three and four, good. Uh, the feat we want to have here is, uh, Shake It Off. This one is pretty nice. As for spell, we are not going to get any level 2 spells until level 5 or 6. Um, I think we'll take Mage Armor. We get Entangled because we're a Sylvan Sorcerer, so that's nice. Uh, the dog... Uh, what was the that I wanted to take here. Uh, two seconds, please. Ah, oh, yes, of course. Weapon focus, bite. Now, for the rest of the party, we have uh, Lan. Be right back. So, Lan on level three uh, will take a level of Cleric. He won't get very high um, spells. Uh, but he's supposed to be a crusader as well, so. And we want to take, let's see here, perception and mobility. As for the feet, 
we I feel this is a little bit early to take it, but we'll take it anyways. Uh, Meta Magic, Extended Spell. Uh, channel Positive Energy. Ah. Domain. Not entirely sure what domain I want to take on him. Probably Glory. See, this is close. Touch. Save, save it. Just looking at the uh, domain spells there. I think it's glory. As for his crusader bonus feat, uh, I'll take weapon bonus. Uh, short bow. Next up is Camellia, and her third level is Shaman. Uh, trickery and Perception. Point blank shot. Might be better to take weapon focus longbow. Comes later down the line. And then we have Sila. Her third level is Paladin. And the skills in question are we need a persuasion up to five. Arcana at 2, so that one is done. Mobility at 3, so that one is done. Good. As feet, we need Boon Companion. This does enables the Animal Companion to be um, 4 levels higher. Um, there are more of these you can take uh, to get it even higher. Um, and I think we are going to have to... No, we're not, because both Paladin and the Sohai Monk are animal companion classes, so this will enable us to have the uh, the pet up to level 20. And I think that's it. Well, her horse leveled up. Level 3, go with Athletics and Perception. And... Die Hard. I'm not sure about that one. Well, it's a bulwark, so it makes sense, actually. Okay, that's that out of the way. Let's talk to the bartender. A strange figure towers over the bar. A huge, ungainly man with skin so milky white that his blue veins are visible even from a distance. His bald head is equal parts lumpy and pitted, and blood-filled eyes stare impassively out at you from beneath his pale brows. The glass in the albino's large clumsy hand looks dangerously delicate, as if one twitch of those calloused fingers would be enough to crush it. A gold medallion engraved with a tankard gleams around his neck. What'll it be? Who are you? The albino slowly takes your measure with his red eyes and finally with a gentle sigh says, Gemmel Hawks, Vampire. Are you really a vampire? Gemmel gives you a long look of reproach, then grudgingly answers, No. How did you end up in the Crusader City? How did anyone end up here? How did you, or them? With a huge hand, the tavern keeper gestures at the ragtag group assembled in the room. The world is big, but still there isn't a place for everyone. People who no longer have a life anywhere else, they end up here. Any news in the city? The albino looks around. There are demons everywhere. And uh, you showed up. Are there any places in the city worth visiting? If you mean places that normal people usually stay well away from, then there are plenty, like the Pitaxian wine cellar. Gemmel pauses for effect, like the name of the place alone should make you quiver in fear. It once belonged to a Pitaxian trading house. Then King Irovetti came to power in Pitax, and property started changing hands. 
Soon after, the seller's shop assistant once was found in a ditch. Not all of him, mind, just his head. Numerian gangsters had taken possession of the place. They wanted to sell something stronger than wine on the street, and they ended up on the gallows. Then, King Erovetti's number was up, so now the store stands empty, empty and unclaimed. People say that a headless ghost wanders the place at night, moaning ghoulishly. Ooh. After coming to the end of his story, unusually long by his standards, the tavern keeper takes a swig from his tankard. Just don't ask me how it makes any noise with that no head. I wasn't there. I just tell it like I heard it. <coughs> I see you're not one for talking. Jemal gives you a long mournful look and says nothing. He does have a couple of items, but I don't think any of these... Well, the, the, the bag of holding is nice, but... So we'll get the bag of holding at some point, but we don't have 13,000. This one is a good, uh, good ring, though. I don't think we'll be able to get that much money uh, in the beginning chapter. We can uh, do bulk selling here. Although I don't know why it doesn't pick these items. I don't need them. These we need to keep. Okay, so the scrolls, the potions. There's endurance. We can sell that because, yeah, I won't use it. Blur can be good. 45 healing potions. A large person. Good for now. Haste. Good for now. We don't need that. Mage armor. Good for now. Protection from chaos. Not when the cost level is 1. This one might be decent. Actually, protection from chaos. 1 minute. No, we don't need it. Protection from cold. I'm going to keep the protection from cold. These as well. Kind of annoying. Reduce person. I don't need that. Resist cold. Sure. Oh, this just gives a resist. This is immunity. So off you go. Fear's endurance again. Don't feel I need that. Bless. Force fear. No. Find favor is nice to have as a scroll. Doom can be useful. The inflict wounds. I think those are touch. Yes, they are. So. Mage armor, mage mis mage magic missile, protection from good, don't need that. Ray of sickening, nah. Reduce person, nah. Remove fear, can be useful. Remove sickness, it's not what it says. Uh, I'll keep it. Resist cold, keep that. No, sell it. Less restoration is... Very nice to have. Shield of Faith can be good. Summon Monster can be good. Summon Small Water Elemental and Unbreakable Heart. Okay, those are fine. I'd like to get rid of these, but I think I'll sell these to the blacksmith outside. Same with any weapons. So, that's 1,300 at least. Now, who next? I think Anivia has said all she... No, she hasn't. Anivia, in her muted colors, blends almost perfectly into the background. She appears relaxed, but her seemingly unfocused eyes are taking in everything around her, tracking and filtering potential threats. The only tell is the way she drums her fingers on her hip near the weapon sheath. She shows no sign of her injuries and confidently leans on her previously broken leg. She pretends to have just noticed you, even though she watched you approach from afar. Oh, hey, see how they patched me up. Now I can run, jump, or dance a jig if I feel like it. Are there any suspicious places in the city that I should pay attention to? There were a couple of spots I wanted to check out, but I didn't have time. If there really is a den of cultists there, it would be good if you could swoop in there and bust some heads. You don't even need a search warrant. And Evia shoots you a crooked smile. First one is the Silken Thread. It's a funny little tailor shop that doesn't take any orders and never buys any fabric, but they always seem oh so busy. They're busy with something in there alright, but sewing it ain't. Second one is the Alchemy Shop, Topaz Solutions. 
and they trade in everything, not just healing potions. Judging by the ingredients they've been buying on the black market, there's something fishy about the alchemical rituals going down in that place. Tell me about yourself. She shrugs with a lazy smile. I'd be happy to, but there's kind of nothing to tell. So interesting about me. Where are you from? Nowhere. I was blown in the wind, blown in by the wind, and found in a cabbage patch. She stops short. Sorry, that's an old habit of mine. I don't like blabbering about my past, but you saved my skin, so I guess I kind of owe it to you not to clown around, right? I am from Nidal, and I wouldn't wish my homeland on my worst enemy. You've heard of the place, I'm sure. Ruled by monsters that aren't alive nor dead, and the official religion is this cult of Zon Cuthon. I grew up like in a slum, like a weed between the cobblestones. I didn't have a dad, but I had lots of aunts and aunts and uncles. Aunts, aunts? Yeah. My mum's cronies. No prize for guessing the, guessing the kind of business she was involved in. They gave me a set of lockpicks as soon as I could hold a spoon, and while other kids were picking their noses, I was picking pockets. When I was twelve, the monks of the Silent Shroud came for us. Creepy guys with their mouths sewn shut. They're the guards in Nisrock. Mum gave me to her friends, and we hid in a secret temple of Desna. I never saw my mum again. I lay low in the temple for the next few years, keeping my head down. Washed floors, fetched water, listened to sermons. Funny thing, after a while I started liking Desna's teachings. But as soon as I was old enough, I was out of there. I left Nidal and got as far away as I could. Quite a ragtag group you've got here, from nobles to street thieves. You've got that right. <laughs> Only the best for you. What do you do if the knights and nobles fail to save the world? The low lives are our only hope. How did you meet Irabeth? I was bumming around Timon uh, while back doing this and that. Desnan Tempos sometimes gave me odd jobs. You know, sometimes they needed people with skills like mine. On the surface, it was fine, I guess. After Nidal, the freedom of River Kingdoms should have seemed like heaven, my chance to sit back and enjoy life. But I wasn't happy. There just wasn't any joy in my new life, I was all alone. No one cared about me, and I didn't care about anybody either. I struggled to find a reason to drag myself out of bed every morning. Tying a stone around my neck and jumping into the nearest river started to look pretty appealing. One day I was hired to follow some fellas who the local authorities suspected were Rasmiran spies. I was stupid, I made a rookie mistake, and they caught me. It's like my body had already decided to do what my mind had been fighting, to finally put me out of my misery. Get someone else to kill me since I didn't have the guts to do it myself. They grabbed me. I thought they'd gut me on the spot, but instead they hogtied me and dragged me off. And just like an animal going to the slaughter, my only thought was, let's get this over with. They brought me to their stinking cave, threw me on their altar, and I realized who it was. Cuthites. From Nidal. They had tracked me down after all those years, but I didn't care anymore. Wouldn't even have cared if they'd eaten me alive or whatever. We all gotta go sometime, right? So, I was lying there, staring at those knives pointed at me when fate rolled the dice and I hit the jackpot. Irabeth. There she was, storming into the cave. Picture it. I'm lying on an altar with all these knife-wielding maniacs around me and suddenly Irabeth storms in. I thought it was Iomide herself. Fierce in her shining armor with her gleaming sword raised. She made quick work of those scumbags, chopped them up just like that, I didn't even have time to blink. She untied me, and then... Anivia's face lights up as she chuckles. <laughs> she looked through the papers they had on the table, and she started swearing like a sailor. So much for Iomide, <laughs> How did you and Irabeth end up here in Canabras? After almost being... After almost becoming a human sacrifice, I knew I never wanted to leave Irabeth's side. Desna knows I fell for her instantly, and I fell hard. My misery was gone. And when Irabeth showed me what was in those papers, 
proof that the cultists had a nest in her home city, well, I offered to help without a second thought. Anivia smiles warmly. She must have figured out... Sorry, she must have figured I couldn't wait to get my revenge on the cultists, but I didn't give a damn about them. It was her. I'd go anywhere with her, even on a crusade or into the jaws of a dragon. But I took to life in Canabras like a duck to water. I used to be an outcast wherever I went, but half of the crusaders are the same. After all, who'd, vol who'd volunteer to tangle with demons on the edge of the abyss? You gotta either be a goody two-shoes with too much honor and free time, or a misfit with no life out in the normal world with normal people. People come here to run away from their debts, their past, from themselves. So I fit right in. What is it like living with Irabeth? It's like... living. Without her, I wouldn't be. Seriously, if I were alone, I'd definitely be gone by now. Sure, sometimes we argue, can't deny that. Sometimes we bang our fists on the table and yell so loud that the walls shake. But that's all about order business. But at home? Well, I'll give you an example. I've kinda always wanted to move out of that broom closet we call the house and into somewhere cozier. It ain't like they take a vow of poverty at the Eagle Watch. But every month, somehow most of our spare money is spent on crusader business. Sure, I get mad about it, but... Anivia makes a helpless gesture. It's part of why I love her so much. You know, Erebeth has that thing that matters most for a, perp for a person. A purpose in life. She's always got a reason for whatever she's doing. Her whole life is a crusade, and I... I just drifted around like a leaf in the wind until Desna brought us together. Now, she's the meaning of my life. So, it really makes no difference if you live in a mansion or under a, under a bush. Thank you for your answers. Thanks for asking. Telling you all this kinda made me feel better. What are your responsibilities in the Eagle Watch? Anivia smiles evasively. Nothing official. I'm not even a knight, you know. I just hang around. You sure you want to know the details? Catching traitors and spies and cultists is no walk in the park. It's a delicate job. You can't always do it all within the letter of the law. What if we surprise some suspicious blighter with an official search? Everyone will know about it before long, starting with their cronies. Then again, sneaking into people's houses at night ain't exactly legal. Crusaders can't be doing stuff like that, can they? Well, I'm not exactly a knight. She trails off. I have to go. Alright, you watch yourself now. Then we have Kiado. I'll just say, I believe that help is already on the, the way. The Queen will not leave us to die. And Visali Rathimus. A stout old man with a fuzzy grey beard mumbles a prayer. He's as tired as everyone else in the tavern, but determination is stamped upon his haggard face. What can I do for you? Who are you? Visali Rathimus, rector of the local temple of Abadar. The temple is gone, though. And if we snooze here for much longer, the city will be lost as well. Who is that boy with you? This one? Kiado the shepherd, my apprentice. He's a smart boy, and, if his, and his faith is strong. He serves Erastil, though, but there's still something he can learn from an old servant of Abadar. He'll be a great cleric when he gets a little older. What kind of help can I expect from you? First, I sell scrolls. I have a lot of them, something for every emergency. Second, while you're here in the tavern, I can read one for you. Guaranteed, no surprises. But you'd better not go into the city without a cleric. I won't be going there myself. I am too old, and my powers are needed here. So he does sell. Uh, Leathora of scrolls. I think he also sells a couple of other items. Yeah. This one is interesting. Uh, rest of these, uh, they are, we, we're going to need these. Oh, also some ingredients, and lots and lots and lots of scrolls and some diamond dust, which is also necessary later on. 
Uh, then we have Lan. Uh, just a little quick pause again. There we go. Let's talk to Lan. Lan greets you with a nod. Here for a chat. Been waiting for you to come and see what strange beast you've taken into your party. What do you think of you of life on the surface? It must be very different from life underground. Of course. As far as living conditions, the surface is definitely a better place to be. It is easier to get good food and water, not to mention build a house and even grow a few things. In older, well-established settlements, you don't have to deal with anything scarier than rats, or maybe foxes stealing chickens, or demon lords paying a visit. As for the kind of lives you have, I heard a story about demon worshippers abducting a whole family and sacrificing them one by one while the others watched. But there were some brave crusader knights nearby, and they killed the villains and saved everyone. Uh, what? That doesn't even make sense. And I heard another story. A young blacksmith lost his arm in a fire, couldn't work to feed his wife and baby. They tried their best and lived from hand to mouth, but they were still destitute. In the end, the desperate blacksmith robbed a traveller one night on the road. But there were some brave crusader knights nearby, and they caught the robber and threw him in prison. Not long after, his wife smothered their baby and hanged herself. What kind of stories are these, Lan? Up here, the same person can proudly say he's protecting the innocent from demons, and then look the other way while the same innocent starves, just because they were born into a poor family. Queen Galfrey prolongs her life with sun orchid elixirs that cost enough to feed an entire city. Back in our caves, everyone is equally poor, and if one person starves, the whole tribe starves. We don't abandon our own in times of trouble. That's the power of a tribe. The laws of the surface are made so that some get everything and others get nothing. I might just be a naive fool from the caves, but I don't understand how it's possible to have so much more and share so much less. The uh, Galfrey thing is quite long, so but that should give you the option to pause. Anyway, look who I'm talking to. You must know life on the surface much better than I do. We're in a struggle for our very survival against the Abyss. This is no time to upend society in a quest for fairness. So, you think if the world wound hadn't happened, the surface would already would have already changed for the better? I'm not so sure. I'm not even sure my kinfolk would find their way to inventing their own aristocracy if they ever got their hands on anything valuable enough to divide unfairly. But what's the point of being prince of all caves, holes, holes and gorges if your only throne is a boulder and your only crown is made of rat skulls? I'd like to know more about you. Let me guess. Your first question is, can you wear a hat with your one horn? Am I right? So, can you wear a hat with your one horn? Sure I can, but certain designs don't suit me well. Lan speaks in a deadly serious voice. You speak common much better than the rest of your tribe. Funnily enough, common isn't all that common underground, Lan says, but your observation is correct. I used to live on the surface with my parents for a while and had a chance to learn a couple of things. The language and the fact that every peasant who sees my scaly mug screams, demon and runs away. I don't know if you're interested, but my mum wasn't from an underground tribe. She was a smuggler, the kind that used the dungeons of Canabras to secretly move and store goods. One time, two gangs couldn't agree on how to share a prime cut, got into a fight, and the winners threw the losers down a hole, dead and living alike. My dad went to check if the corpses had anything useful on them, and he found a girl from the surface, barely clinging to life. An incredible feeling sparked between them. Or maybe the girl just liked men with scales and a cat nose. That might be it. One way or another, he got her back on her feet, and he later even left his home caves. She left her smuggling behind, and they began an honest life together. Now that's the delightful story of how old Lan came into this world. Now the next chapter, however. My family and I never stayed in one place for long. We lived sometimes on the surface, sometimes underground. We couldn't find a place to call home. Living, living in the caves was hard on my mum, and my dad's appearance raised too many questions in Mendev. They're at war with the demons, after all. 
In the end, my parents decided to stop making each other miserable and separated. My father and I returned to our tribe. I think the peasants screaming, Demon! had something to do with it. Or maybe Dad just couldn't stand life without rat tail soup. I wouldn't rule out the possibility. Did you come with me so you could see the surface again? I... No, that wasn't it. I just don't have much patience for certain types of creatures. Demons, I mean. If they want to destroy Canabras, I'll be on the side of the people they're attacking. Lan looks away. I don't like it when my subordinates hide things from me. Lan doesn't seem bothered by the threat. He shrugs. It's not a secret or anything, just some private emotions and things that don't matter to anyone besides me. But if you want to listen, be my guest. My birth, hell take me, turned out to be a great misfortune for my parents, all because I'm relatively healthy. I'm the best thing that can come from a marriage between a cave-dwelling mongrel and anyone from the surface. A healthy child with the right number of hands and feet, no apparent defects, no missing organs or other problems. They saw hope in me, so risked having more children. They thought it would somehow be alright. A growl edges into Lan's voice. I could have had four brothers. The first was born two years after me and died three years later. He didn't have a nose. Nothing even remotely resembling one. He could barely... he could only breathe through his mouth. Mum and Dad were afraid to take their eyes off him for fear he'd choke and suffocate on something. But in the end, it was his weak heart that killed him. Then there was another pregnancy, and birth. I pretended I was sleeping, but snuck out of my bedroom and listened under the door. All those hours, it was very strange, but I never heard the newborn screaming. Mum moaning, yes, the priest praying. Then I dared to open the door a little and looked inside. The priests stood there, very pale. One of them was holding something, a small object that fit in his palm. He asked, do you know what this is? And the other said, I think it's a head. Lan stops. Please go on. Lan pauses, exhales and continues in a steadier voice. It turned out that this time mom was expecting triplets. The first of the babies was born in pieces, and the two others didn't live long enough to draw their first breath. About three weeks later, my father took me to the caves. He didn't want to leave, I could see it in his face, but I think my mum and he decided it together. The curse my people have carried since the first crusade stood between them, not to mention the four dead babies. And old age was rapidly taking its toll on my father. After we returned to the cave, he only lived for another four years. So, if you're asking me why I decided to go with you to the surface and join the Crusaders, well, the answer is, I've always wanted to. I was afraid to leave my tribe, but it always haunted me that I'd die in a world where four Crusades could do nothing to stop the beasts from the abyss, and the number of victims kept growing. I want to change that, or at least try to. And if changing things is too much to ask, then at least get a little revenge. The others who are behind the world wound owe me a great debt. The lives of four brothers, all of my mother's tears, and my father's broken heart. It's a lot. It's so much that killing a couple of demons won't do it for me. I want to do something real, and I'm ready to pay any price. Call it my personal crusade, if you like. Lan gives you a slanted grin. I used to think that things would be better if I'd never been born. But now I think I was born for this, to settle the score. Why didn't you go up and join the Crusaders before? I couldn't just abandon my tribe. I'm their best hunter. They'll have it much harder without me, but now that the demons have nearly destroyed Canabras and the caves almost collapsed on our heads, sitting and waiting it out just wasn't an option anymore. Anyway, I'm more useful up here than I'm down there. Plus, the chief let me go, which means my debt to the tribe has been paid. Would you like to find your mother? No. The word flies from Lan's mouth faster than an arrow. Then, after a pause, he continues. I don't want to meet her. 
Uh, not because I feel any resentment, it's just that she's a half-elf. She's barely got her first grey hair, and I'll be a ramshackle old man. He's buried enough children, there is no need to make her witness the death of another one. I hope you understand. Your parents' love didn't survive hardship, that, but that doesn't mean the same thing will happen to you. What if you find true love, someone who won't leave you no matter what? And break my beloved's heart when I die in her arms five years later? Now that's a fine thing to do to the person you love. And then again, there's a chance I'll inspire some tragic bard to write a tearful ballad. Thanks for sharing, Lan. Thanks for listening. Mongols have short lifespans, but you don't look like you're getting old or dying. How old are you? Lan chuckles. I'm as old as I look, no surprises there. But remember so? He's ten years older than me. I remember him back when he was a fearless warrior, and day by day I watched him turn into an old man. Him and my father. It happens very quickly. First, you miss a shot because you don't see the target as clearly as you used to. You think it's because your eyes are tired. You tell yourself it'll get better tomorrow. Then you notice you're having trouble breathing, that climbing is harder than before. Lan clenches and unclenches his human fist. Your fingers stop bending, you have to tie your sword to your hand, you can't even put on your greaves without help. When you're washing your face in a stream, sometimes you catch sight of a grey-haired, wrinkled old man you don't recognise. And this goes on until one day you come across a cave beast and you realise you can't outrun it. Lan takes a breath. My dad kept diaries marking all the signs. And I saw it too. The last year I had to help him get out of bed, help him dress, remind him to eat. Sometimes he forgot my name. I told him that we should have stayed on the surface, and he joked that dodging a goddess was behaviour unworthy of a crusader. He meant for Asma. Every morning I wake up and check how I feel, but there are no signs yet. Even so, I know I don't have much time. I need to do something useful before I forget why I came here. I want to talk about Wenduag. Are you sure? Land size. Alright. Tell me about your connection to Wenduag. My connection to Wenduag? I mean, where do I start? Land turns the unexpressive reptile half of his face to you. We grew up together, trained together. She was the chief's daughter. She was groomed to be the best all her life, and then I came along. We were rivals, but we dragged each other out of tight spots too. I've always been drawn to grand heroic gestures, sometimes idiotic ones, whereas Wendu liked to roam unexplored passages, finding new caves and making maps. She wanted to be a great huntress, the one who'd make it through the shield maze, but instead she... Lan shakes his head. It'd be better if she'd died. The death of a friend is painful, but watching a friend become a shadow of their former self is unbearable. She doesn't think she's a shadow of her former self. Of course, she thinks she did everything right, because the second she starts to doubt herself, she'll have to face the truth, to admit that she's just a cannibal that demons use as, their wish, as they wish. Lan's frown looks almost like a wince. She wants to get stronger and stronger, but for what? I'll never understand what drives her. Were you just friends, or were you more than that? Wow, you really p don't pull your punches, do you? Lan exhales loudly. There was a time when I asked myself the same question. When do I knew me better than anyone? She understood me better than anyone. She was my first woman, but we never loved one another. Maybe I could have grown to love her, but it always seemed like she never understood what love was. Maybe she just wasn't capable of those kinds of feelings. Thanks. I found out everything I wanted to know. If you ever want to reopen any more of my old wounds, you know where to find me. Do tell me your story again just to get it uh, grayed out. I have found out everything I wanted to know. Thank you. True thing. Tell me about your people. Of course. What would you like to know? What is it like living in your caves? Oh! Lan gives you a broad smile. His smile is strange, as if it falters where his human features meet his animal ones. 
Imagine that in the entire world there's only a few hundred like you. There's not an inch of fertile ground anywhere, nowhere to grow grain for bread or cotton and linen for cloth. Your neighbours are beasts who want to eat you, or parasites who want to infect you with their larvae and then eat you. And it's not that bad because you can try to eat most of the things that are trying to eat you. Sometimes at the risk of getting poisoned, sometimes with almost no risk at all. In the worst years, there's not a, sil there's not a single living thing anywhere to be found, predator or prey. That's when you eat mushroom soup, I'd say three times a day, but there was barely enough for once every three days. Land shrugs. But life underground has its upsides, pun intended. There's no risk of losing the roof over your head. There's no bad weather. Not counting the earthquakes, of course. Are you really the descendants of the First Crusaders? More like demons born, aren't we? Sad, but true. Without the demons, there would be no mongrels. It is the magic of the world wound that affected our ancestors and made their children the way that we are. Like most in our tribe, Chief Sol fancies himself a descendant of the underground crusaders, the ones our heroic ancestors left to guard the caves. I don't know if it's true or not. That angel came to our caves for a reason. Maybe he remembered us. Those were evil and dangerous times after the first crusade. Hundreds of crusaders began having children, and the babies were born with fangs and horns and warts that covered half their face. People didn't like the new look. The Inquisitors sure didn't. So our ancestors fled persecution and made a home for themselves down there, under the ground. They probably intended to find a cure for their children and hoped to return in time. But it never happened. Instead, the world wound's terrible legacy was passed down from generation to generation. Mongrel parents can only guess what their child will look like. Each of us is born with a new muta mutation. Many mutations are fatal. Dan stops, then goes on quietly. Down in the caves, we usually don't congratulate the family for the birth of a child until they turn at least three. Most don't even get a name before that. There's no point. It hasn't been that long since the First Crusade. Why do you know so little about your ancestors? Our lives are much, much shorter than most Uplanders. Up here, only a few generations passed and many still Liv, who remembers old Sarkoris as it stood untouched by the demons. Queen Galfrey, for example. But where we live? Mongols start getting old much earlier than humans, much faster and with more devastating consequences. Few live past 40, and fewer still live long enough to die of old age. Hunger, disease and monsters from the deep are more effective killers than time. So, for us, the story of the First Crusade is a legend that happened generations ago. There are no living witnesses. We have a tale of the wise and great ancestors who left us to stand guard in the catacombs. But in reality, I suspect they were desperate wretches who couldn't figure out how to dispel the demonic plague, and who were abandoned by their own kind. You have a way to tell day and night. You can't see the sun in your caves. Every mongrel settlement has a big gong, which we treat like a relic. The gong keeper hits it twice a day to mark the beginning and end. But this custom does not keep time very precisely. Every mongrel child has snuck up to the gong to strike it at the wrong time at least once, just out of pure mischief. Nothing could keep me away from it, not even the fact that I only have one ear, which means it would take double the punishment once I was caught. So, sometimes the wrong strikes get mixed in with the right ones and the tribe can find itself jumping up to greet the morning in the middle of the night. Do mongrel tribes fight each other? There were some skirmishes and I've been forced to kill my kinfolk before too. Van speaks in a steady voice. Fights most often break out over food. We have laws in the caves, written and unwritten rules that we follow. We respect one another's right to live, but hunger, it can push a person over the edge. I've never, never, you can count on that, stolen someone else's kill. But I can understand, understand those of my kin who tried. To hear your kids begging for food and not be able to feed them is terrifying. He frowns and goes silent. You're the only member of the Neathholm tribe to call your people Mongols. Who is that? 
Uh, because all of Galarian calls us that? I don't see the point of all this hemming and hawing over what we're called. Anyone who finds it offensive or takes issue with it can lead the charge against the name. No one's stopping them. But personally, I'm not going to pick a fight over something as unimportant as a name. Thank you. I have found out everything I wanted to know. You said you were prepared to risk your life to do something meaningful. What exactly did you mean? To invent a new salad and have it named after me, Land remarks grimly. Then he sighs. Truth be told, I don't know. It would be much easier if all I really wanted was to kill demons, then a few more demons, then more demons after that. Good honest rage and no needless brooding. I think I actually envy the warriors who can live like that. But I can't. If life's taught me anything, it's that there are no easy choices. Dying a glorious death isn't enough. Some heroes of the Crusades did that, and also saved entire settlements, erected the ward stones. Their actions kept the lands of Mendev safe for decades. That's what I want, for my dumb short life to have meant something. Think I have an exaggerated opinion of myself? Some scaly freak crawls out of the caves and wants to take control of the ward stones and flaunt Iomedae's banner? Any fool can charter the front lines of the demonic armies and die there, but what good would th will that do? I want something meaningful, you know. Even if I have to pay the highest price, especially if I have to pay it, there are plenty of worthier people who need to survive this war and tell everyone else what nutcases we were. Thank you for your answers. So long. I'm going to have to divide this into two episodes. There are still more people to talk to, and jeez, that was a lot of talking. I need to have a few sips of water here, because, uh, yeah. So, uh, if you have any questions, very unlikely, since I've probably gotten out a lot of story from the characters we've spoken to, or comments, which is more likely, then please... Okay, please do feel free to leave those in the comment section below. For now, I hope you enjoyed the episode, and thank you so much for joining me, and I will see you all in the next one.